Hi and welcome to my channel Cardiology and Beyond. I'm Dr. Sonali, an interventional cardiologist from India. Today's video is going to be a little bit of an introductory topic on how murmurs are produced. I'll be talking about the various physics laws that govern the production of murmurs and what are the various examples of murmurs that we encounter. So let's mind map today's video. Today's topic is going to fall under clinical examination, specifically auscultation and auscultation of murmurs, of which I'm going to be talking about production of murmurs. There are four major questions that we'll be tackling today, so try to answer them yourself right now. And if not, we're going to be anyway dealing with them in the ensuing video. So let's begin. What law governs the formation of heart murmurs? Now, this law is used extensively in fluid dynamics and it is called Poisy's law. Pardon my pronunciation, it is a French word. So, this law describes the flow of fluids. And how are murmurs produced? Essentially, murmurs are produced because of disturbance of blood flow, that is, because of the presence of turbulence. Now, the flow of fluids can either be laminar or turbulent. Now, if you look at this diagram, you have laminar flow in a blood vessel in which the central particle of blood has a greater velocity than the particles which are at the sides of the tube or at the sides of the blood vessel. However, when the flow of blood becomes turbulent, it is all haywire. There is a lot of difference in the pressure and the velocity of every particle and it is a complete mixture. So this Poisy's law is actually governed by this particular equation in which Q is equal to pi into P into R raised to 4 divided by 8 into eta into length. So what do these alphabets mean? Q is essentially the velocity of blood flow. P is the pressure head or the pressure gradient between two points of a blood vessel. R is the radius of the blood vessel, eta is the viscosity of the blood and L is length of, the blood, uh, length of the blood vessel or the tube. So when you rearrange all these alphabets and if you get pressure, then pressure becomes directly proportional to the flow velocity, to the viscosity and length of the blood vessel and it is inversely proportional to the radius. So what it means is when the pressure gradient or the pressure head across a blood vessel or across a chamber in the case of the heart increases because of all these reasons which affect it, then the turbulence of blood flow increases which gives rise to murmurs. Now that we have been introduced to the concept of blood turbulence, how is turbulence of flow imaged? So in real life, on a normal basis, we use an echocardiography with color Doppler effects to see the turbulence of blood. And what we see is a mosaic of colors that is a mixture of different colors to indicate that the blood is undergoing turbulence, either because of a stenotic lesion across a valve or because of a leaking valve or a regurgitating valve. So for example, here is an example of a tricuspid valve. This is the right atrium, this is the right ventricle. And normally the blood should flow downstream from the right atrium to the right ventricle. However, this tricuspid valve is diseased, it is a bit thickened also, and it is not working well because it is causing a significant amount of regurgitation back into the right atrium. Now when you look at the color, when the valve is regurgitating, there's a lot of mixture of velocities. There's a lot of blues and yellows and oranges, which essentially points to the fact that there is a mosaicism of colors indicating that there is turbulence of blood flow. So is there any number which will help predict if the flow is going to be laminar or turbulent, which, which essentially means that whether we'll be able to know if that particular flow will give rise to a murmur. So there is a number called the Reynolds number, which is shown by this equation here, where the Reynolds number is equal to rho into V into D divided by eta. So what do they all stand for? RE obviously points to the Reynolds number. Rho points to the density of blood. V is the velocity of blood flow. We can also call it Q, as was seen in the previous equation. D is the diameter of the blood vessel, whereas eta again is the blood viscosity. 
So when the Reynolds number is less than 2000, the blood flow will be laminar. And when it is more than 3000, it is usually turbulent. So this is a rough estimate of predicting whether the flow would be laminar or turbulent. So this is what we see in that graph to understand this concept further. So we have flow versus the perfusion pressure. And as the flow and perfusion pressure increase, there is laminar flow. However, at a certain point, a critical Reynolds number is exceeded. For example, if Reynolds number becomes more than 3000, suppose it becomes 4000, then at this point, the flow is no longer laminar and it in fact, in fact now starts becoming turbulent. Now that we've understood that murmur is produced because of turbulence of blood flow, either in the blood vessel or the chamber of the heart, what are the two factors which determine the frequency of a murmur? Now, many times we hear in clinical practice, someone say that, oh, it's a high frequency murmur or it's a low frequency murmur. What does it really mean? So the two factors which determine the frequency or the pitch of a murmur is number one, the pressure gradient involved in the production of this turbulent flow, which is what we saw with Poisy's equation. The second point is the actual flow volume or the amount of blood which is going across the diseased valve. Now the thumb rule for this determination of frequency of murmur is if there is more pressure gradient, the frequency is going to be high. If the actual flow or the amount of blood is going to be more, then the low frequencies are going to be more. So the mnemonic is more flow, more low frequency and more pressure gradient, high is the frequency. Right? So with this caveat, let's start with some examples. Suppose you have a situation wherein a murmur is produced under these two conditions. There is high pressure gradient and low blood volume. When this combination is there, you see it classically in mitral regurgitation. So why is there a high pressure gradient in mitral regurgitation? During systole, when the mitral valve is regurgitating, let's say the LV systolic pressure is 120 and the simultaneous LA pressure is say about 20. So the pressure difference between LV and LA will now be 100, which is a pretty high pressure gradient. At the same time, the amount of blood volume which is regurgitating across the mitral valve into the left atrium is not that high as compared to the total cardiac output. So because some amount of blood is still going forward into the aorta, relatively the blood volume is low. So when you have a high pressure gradient, you get high frequency and the blood volume is not high, so you do not get the low frequency. As a result, this combination of MR gives rise to a high frequency murmur. Now, of interest, it is interesting to know that an MR murmur is classically described to be a blowing type of high frequency murmur. It is said that it is akin to blowing in a hollow reed. Now, what is a reed? A reed is a piece of dry bamboo which is used in some musical instruments. For example, the saxophone or the clarinet. And what happens is that the musician blows air through the mouthpiece where the reed is firmly attached and the air makes this reed vibrate. So bamboo sticks give rise to this particular reed. So it's a very classic description of the MR murmur blowing high frequency murmur. Next we come to another example wherein the production of a murmur has an associated low pressure gradient but a very high blood volume. So this is classically seen in cases of mitral stenosis. Now we know that mitral stenosis murmur occurs in diastole. It's a classic mid-diastolic murmur. So why is the pressure gradient low? Let's say, for example, during diastole, the LA pressure has risen to, say, up to 30 millimeters of mercury, but the LV diastolic pressure is not risen. Let's say it is around 10. 
So the difference between LA and LV pressures in diastole would be around 20 millimeters of mercury. Now this gradient is obviously low as compared to the very high pressure gradient that we saw with mitral regurgitation. The blood volume across the stenotic mitral valve is high. That is because all of the cardiac output and the venous return which comes back into the LA is going to pass across this diseased mitral valve. As a result, the blood volume is going to be high. So this combination of a low pressure gradient and a high blood volume would give rise to more of lower frequencies. So you get a low to medium frequency mid-diastolic mitral stenotic murmur. Now the classic description of an MS murmur is a rumbling murmur. And what it means is they say that it sounds like distant thundering clouds. A distant thundering rumble is what makes you think of a mitral stenotic murmur. Coming to another example, we have a condition wherein the murmur is produced because of a high pressure gradient and high blood volume. So in this, inst in this instance, both the pressure gradient as well as the amount of blood is high. So the high pressure gradient will give rise to a high frequency, but the high volume will give rise to a low frequency. So this is commonly seen in cases of aortic stenosis. Now in cases of severe aortic stenosis, the LV to aortic pressure gradient is obviously going to be high and also because the entire cardiac output has to pass across the diseased aortic valve, the blood volume is also going to be high. As a result, there is a mixture of frequencies and you get mixed frequency ejection systolic murmur of aortic stenosis. So which of the two, diaphragm or bell of the stethoscope, is to be used to auscultate these various murmurs of different frequencies? So the answer is both and each are to be used for different occasions. So remember, if there are high frequency sounds like what we see with mitral regurgitation, then use a diaphragm. And if there are low frequency sounds like what we hear with the diastolic rumble of mitral stenosis, use the bell. As always, like, share, subscribe, comment and press the bell icon. And I'll see you next time with another video.